Well, good morning. How we doing? Isn't that great worship? That was so awesome. Hey, I am super glad to be uh, back here uh, today. I've been, I was gone for a couple weeks. Um, maybe you didn't notice, but, uh, um, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you, two weeks ago, uh, Kathy and I were up in Sacramento. Our, uh, our oldest son is, uh, is having twins. I know you're thinking, you're way too young to be a grandfather. But uh, we're having twins, and, uh, and so we were up there to, to be with them when they found out the gender of the, the babies. And so, uh, so we're having a boy and a girl. We got one of each. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So everybody wins. It's good. So it was, it was really good. Uh, so that was exciting. Um, and then uh, last week, actually, I was out at our Echo Park location because uh, Christopher LaPelle, um, who has ministered out there at Golden West Christian Church for 31 years. He is retiring from the ministry there at the church um, to, to go full-time with Hope for Cambodia, um, his incredible ministry um, in Cambodia. And some of you guys uh, know Christopher. You know of the ministry there because you've gone. Um, and so you know how phenomenal that is. And the expectation is we're expecting that it's going to just be even greater now that he's focusing on that 100% full time. Um, some of you may not know and maybe you haven't been there. Well, we're going to be going next summer and you need to you need to consider that. You need to think about going and uh, it's a, a phenomenal ministry and uh, it, you, you will be you'll be blessed. So anyway, I was out there uh, representing you um, to uh, to just uh, 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 honor Christopher for his faithful service there. Pray over him for the continued ministry of, uh, of Hope for Cambodia. So um, there's a gala coming up in September that uh, you guys might want to uh, uh, check out and be a part of to, to support the, the ministry of Hope for Cambodia. So uh, anyway, that's where, that's where I've been the last couple of weeks. But, but I'm really excited to be here. We're kicking off a new series today in 1 John. Um, and uh, I hope you're, hope you're ready to go. Are we ready to go? Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, I've been to a lot of funerals. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I've been to a lot of funerals. Now, um, a lot of that is because when you're a pastor, you go to a lot of funerals. Um, so I've done a lot of funerals. I've been to a lot of funerals. But uh, that's kind of kind of sometimes goes uh, with the territory. But uh, when you go to a funeral, um, I don't know if you're like me, but one thing that, that usually happens is it's a time to evaluate your own life. Do you ever do that? Like you go to a funeral because you're, 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 you know, you're celebrating, uh, you know, someone's life. You're looking back at their life. You're realizing that their life here on earth is over. And you begin to start evaluating your own life. Now, part of what that evaluation ends up being is, is you evaluate what you believe, right? For some people, it's like, how sure am I about what I believe? Am I confident in what I believe about God? What about, what about what I believe is going to happen to me when, when I die? Do I feel good about that? Do I feel confident about that? Do, do, do I know what's going to happen to me after I die? You know, that's part of that evaluation process, I think, that happens when you, you end up going to a funeral. And so how confident are you? How confident are you about what will happen when you die? When people are gathering around to talk about your life, how confident are you of what's going to happen to you after you die? How sure are you that you're going to go to heaven? I, I remember a time in my life when I was younger um, when I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. I wasn't confident that if I died, I knew that I was going to go to heaven. I'll tell you this. There, it's a terrible thing to be unsure of of what's going to happen when you die. That's a terrible thing to be uncertain of, to be, have to question, to feel uneasy about. Another thing you evaluate 
um, in those times is how you're living your life now. Am I doing the things that I should be doing? Am I on the right track spiritually? Do I know God the way I should know God? Is he pleased with me in the way that I'm living? We've, I think we tend to, to ask those questions at those times. And if, if you go through those times, you know, if, you, if you're someone who, who goes through those times when you just need assurance, just assurance that, that you're on the right track in your life, assurance that, that you do, in fact, know God the way he wants you to, assurance that you're going to go to heaven when you die. If you ever go through that and you ever feel that, guess what? You're not alone. You're not alone at all. In fact, I think a lot of Christians go through that and have those periods of time. I believe that it's always been that way for Christians, even back to the, the, all the way back to the early believers, those who believed in the New Testament times. In fact, right after Jesus rose from the, the grave, he rose from the dead, um, he began to appear to his followers, right? And, and, uh, and the news began to spread that he was alive. But one of the 12 apostles himself, Thomas, he didn't believe it. Remember, we just talked about him not that long ago, right? The, 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 the Sunday right after Easter, we talked about Thomas. And even though Jesus had, had told them that the resurrection was going to happen, Thomas had his doubts. He was not sure what he believed about Jesus. He wasn't sure. He said he wouldn't believe unless he could see the marks in his hands, unless he could put his hand in the, in the hole in his side where Jesus had been pierced with the sword. So Jesus then appears to Thomas. He says, hey, Thomas, here's my hands. Go ahead, put your hand in my side. And you know what? When Thomas does, his doubts, they're wiped away. And he believes and then Jesus says to Thomas, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who do not see and still believe. And remember, that's us. That's us. Those who have, have not seen, but yet we still believe. Now, jump ahead 60 years from Jesus' encounter with Thomas. 60 years after that, the message of Jesus, it's spreading all over the known world at that time. The number of people was growing, uh, people who did not see and yet still believe, that number is growing. All but one of the apostles has been killed for their faith, for preaching the gospel. They've all been killed but one, all but John. John's the only one still alive. In fact, he's a part of a small group of people who had seen Jesus um, after his resurrection. Now, unfortunately, during this time, over these years, um, some false teaching had begun to arise. Some false teaching had begun to, to spread and surface in different areas. One of the false teachings of that time is, is something that, that we know today as Gnosticism. Now, let me just tell you just real briefly, let me scratch the surface on, on what Gnosticism is and um, what it is then and, and, and kind of the, it lingers on even today. Part of what Gnostics believe is that matter um, is evil. It's impure. Anything that's physical is, is just evil. It's impure. The spirit, a person's spirit, that's all that really counts. That's all that's really important. So they believe that that salvation did not come from faith in Jesus. Fa uh, salvation came through higher knowledge, higher knowledge um, that, that they had about Jesus, about the Messiah. They believed that obedience to God was not really that important because um, since the body is evil, because it's matter, because it's evil, then what you do with your body doesn't really matter. As long as your spirit is right with God, that, that's what matters. So you could, as long as you believe right, then you can go out and live however you want. You can do whatever you want. There's some of that exists even today. They believe that Jesus was not the Messiah. He couldn't have been because if he was, if he was physical, if he was a, a real person, if he had flesh because the flesh is evil, so he couldn't have been the Messiah. They believe that the Messiah, he could not have been human. So some of them believe he just appeared to have a body. 
or some of them believe that, that, uh, that the divine Christ joined the man Jesus at his baptism, but it departed him before his crucifixion, before, before he died. Because the Messiah couldn't die because he couldn't have flesh. So there's all this weird teaching. And, and, and because of all this, this weird kind of, of teaching and beliefs, um, many believers, many followers of Jesus, they're getting confused, especially new believers. They're getting confused about what is really true about Jesus. What is really true about how to follow Jesus and how to live out my faith in him. So in response to all of that, John, the only one, the one who on the, knew better than anyone on the face of the planet at that time, knew, knew more about the truth about Jesus than anyone else, wrote a letter. We know this letter as the book of 1 John. And he writes it to confirm the truth of the gospel, to confirm the truth about Jesus, and to instruct believers on how to live out our faith, how to live life as a Christian. He gives us the purpose in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. He says, I write this so that you may know. So that you may know. This book is, is supposed to give us assurance. It's supposed to help us know, know the truth about Jesus. Know how to live out our faith. Know that we are saved. So let's read the opening Opening remarks here in the, in the first part. We're just going to read the first four verses today. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and is made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The first thing that, that when, I, when I read this, this little section of Scripture, the thing that, that jumps out the most to me, the thing that I think is very prominent there is that he refers to Jesus as the Word of Life. The Word of Life. And, and th this, this word that he uses for word um, is, is the same word in John 1, 1. If you in his, in his Gospel, John 1, 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. And that word is the word logos. Now this word logos, it was an important word for, for John and for the people of that day, both the Jews and the Greeks. For the Jews, the, the word logos represented something very important because they believed that, that God just perfectly reveals himself through his word. God's word represents who God is. And so they could learn and understand and experience God through his word through his logos. And so, so for the Greeks, on the other hand, they believed that this word logos, um, that, that it represented just like the, the intelligence in the universe, the, the ultimate reason that controls all things. And so it's as if John is saying to everyone, he's saying, this logos that you've been talking about, that your, your philosophers, you know, speak about, that you've been writing about for centuries, well, We've seen him. We've heard him. We've studied him. We've touched him. And I want to tell you a little bit about him. I want to tell you about him. So what does John say about this word of life? I want to just give you four things I see in this passage that he tells us about Jesus, about the word of life, the word of God. Number one, he, he says that he is eternal. He is eternal. Right there in the first part of chapter, uh, verse 1, he says, that which was from the beginning. That which was from the beginning. He always existed. Just like in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He always existed. He's always there. Since only divine beings pre-exist, John is affirming the deity of Jesus. Jesus is God. John wants to get that across to his readers, to us today. By the way, that is one really important thing that distinguishes our faith from the Mormon faith. 
Uh, there's a lot of confusion sometimes about that because, you, you know, you might have some, some Mormon friends or, you know, you'll talk to a Mormon and they'll be like, well, um, yeah, we're Christians too. And you say, well, but we believe in Jesus. Yeah, we believe in Jesus too. And you're like, okay, well, wow, it sounds like, sounds like it's the same. But here's, here's a real important difference is that we believe that Jesus is eternal. Jesus is creator. Their Jesus was created. Their Jesus was created by God just like us. He was a created being. And so we say, yeah, well, it's Jesus, but it's not the same Jesus. Our Jesus is eternal. Our Jesus is creator. Their Jesus is created. That's a small but very significant difference. So it's not the same faith. It's not the same Jesus. John here wants to make sure that we know that Jesus is eternal, therefore divine, that he is God. He is God. But then he goes on in the second part of chapter one, or second part of verse one, and, and, he, and he makes sure that we know that Jesus is also human. He's human. He's fully God, but he's also fully human. It's a little hard for us to understand. You know, that, that's a little difficult. Like, how can he be fully God, fully human? That's what Jesus was. So John says, hey, we heard Jesus. We saw Jesus with our eyes. We looked at Jesus. We, we, we touched Jesus with our hands. Now, a lot of people in the Old Testament, they had heard God. God had spoke to them. He even spoke audibly to them. So a lot of people had heard God. Other people have, had seen aspects of God, but nobody had touched God. Nobody had touched God. But with Jesus, mankind got to experience God in a much more personal and intimate way. Isn't that awesome? Jesus was God with flesh on. He was God with flesh on. In the Greek courts at that time, the, the, the testimony of two senses were required to verify that something actually happened. Okay, you had to hear it and see it or, or touch it and hear it. or you know, Two senses were required to verify that something happened. John here not only gives us two senses, he throws in a third. He's like, hey, we've heard him, we've seen him, we've, we've touched him. To verify, you know what, I've had personal experience and I'm telling you, Jesus, the Messiah, might have been fully God, but he was also a person. He was also human. The third thing he tells us is that this word of life offers us eternal life. Offers us eternal life. He says there in verse 2, he says, this life, this eternal life, which has been made known to you, proclaim to you the eternal life. Life, eternal life can only be experienced, only can be obtained through Jesus Christ. He said that himself in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Except through me. Some people, you might be this person. You might come here today and you think, some, like some people do, that sounds so narrow-minded. Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. You can only get to heaven through, through Jesus Christ. How, that's just so narrow-minded. What about all these other people? What about all these other faiths? People think that, 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 that Christianity sounds so narrow-minded. If you think that way, I just want to tell you something. You're exactly right. It's narrow-minded. Because the Bible tells us that the truth is narrow Right? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many are going to enter through that gate. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. The truth is narrow. The way to eternal life is narrow. It's only through Jesus Christ. And that tells us that unfortunately, most people aren't going to be saved. And it's not because people can't. It's because they're either going to choose not to or they're going to believe in something that's just not the truth. 
Some of that's because Satan, he just loves to lead people away from the truth by convincing them that there's, oh, there's just many ways to God. There's all kinds of ways to God. Convinces people that, that, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere in what you believe. Right? As long as you're good just outweighs your bad. He did that in the first century and he does that today. There's this growing belief today that, that all religions just worship the same God. We just call him something different, right? But that absolutely can't be true because most religions are, exclude the others from being true by their doctrine. And so they can't all be true. They can't all be true. The belief is that, that we can all just coexist under, under one faith. And I'll tell you something, that the demand for a one world religion is going to continue to grow as we enter the last days. Can't, we'll just have this one religion and it'll encompass all of us. You know, all of us, Muslims and Buddhists and Christians and Jews and, and Baha'i and all, and all these, we can all just come under one faith and just agree that it's all just one God. We just come at him from a different angle. That's what the world is going to push for because that's Satan's strategy to, to keep people away from the absolute truth. But the Bible is clear that all ways do not lead to God. The only way to heaven, the only way to God is through a right relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. Eternal life is found only through faith in Jesus Christ. And that word eternal, we need to understand something about eternal life. It's not just forever and ever. Because something that goes on just forever and ever isn't necessarily good, right? I mean, you can have forever and ever. Some people think, oh man, I'm going to be hanging out in a cloud, playing a harp, singing kumbaya forever and ever. That doesn't sound like very much fun. It's not just about forever and ever. That word eternal also carries an element of quality. There's a quality of life. And guess what? This is the cool part. Our eternal life starts when we put our faith in Jesus and we get saved. I'm already beginning to live out my eternal life. Yes, I'm going to pass from this life. This body's going to fail, but I'm just going to keep going. So there's a quality to my eternal life that begins now when I put my faith in Jesus now. I get to begin to experience this quality of life that's going to continue to get better when I pass from this world into the next. It's just going to get even better. The last thing, number four, he tells us um, about the word of life. He is, he is, he is God, he's eternal, um, he is man, he, he uh, offers eternal life, and number four, he allows us to experience fellowship. He allows us to experience fellowship. Verse three, he says, we proclaim this to you so you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father. This is something that we all want and we all need, is fellowship. And you might go, yeah, but I don't really like people that much. But you know what? You still want and need fellowship. I know, some of you, no elbows. Uh, you still want and need fellowship. And you know why I know that? Because that's how you were created. You are created to be in fellowship. God created you that way. This koinonia. And because of Jesus, we can have fellowship with God. We can have fellowship with God. We can have a personal relationship with God. Some people, you might have experienced religion in one way or another, or you maybe you've gone to a church where you've learned about religion and you've learned about God, but maybe you've never fully come to grips and to understand the idea that you get to have a personal relationship with Almighty God. That's what he's offering you in Jesus Christ. You can know him. You can follow him and have a personal relationship with him. That's pretty incredible. But you know what? That's not all to this fellowship that he wants to offer us. Some people claim to, they want that aspect. Like, oh yeah, give me God all day long. I just don't like all the other people. <laughs> right? Some people are just like, I want God in my life. I just don't want to be part of the church. 
Maybe you've been hurt by the church, or maybe, you know, you just, you, you, you think, oh, the church is just full of all those hypocrites, or the church is this, or the church is that, and you're like, I, I'll take God, but I just don't want to be part of the church. Well, you know something, uh, John here, he says some things that are important that I, I think we need to understand is that, that it's important that we have fellowship not just with God, but with other believers. That's important. Jesus desires us to have fellowship with other believers. In John's writing, these two aspects of fellowship, they go hand in hand. They're not supposed to be separated. You, you never had one without the other. We miss out on God's desire for us and, and the blessing that is found in fellowship with others if we have no shared experiences with others. That, that's what the word fellowship, koinonia, is to have it in common, to have these shared experiences with other believers. If you don't spend time with people at your church, you're not going to have the fellowship that God wants you to have. We need each other. God knew we needed each other. That's why he created the church. And man, I'm so glad he did. Aren't you? Aren't you? Okay, good. <laughs> I thought I had a bunch of people who don't, don't like people here. Okay. But you know, here's the, here's the reality. We need, we need fellowship. We need each other. But here's the reality. You can't have the kind of fellowship that he's talking about here with someone who's not a believer. I'm not saying you can't have a good friendship. You can't have a good relationship. But not the kind of fellowship he's talking about with someone who's not a believer. Here's why. Um, if, if, I, if I had one of you up here and, and, uh, and, and you, were, you were facing that way and I'm facing this way and we're like, hey, we're going we're gonna to fellowship with one another, but I'm heading this direction and you're walking that direction. I don't know about you, but we're not going to experience very good fellowship, are we? Because we're heading in opposite directions. And so, yes, we're going to have friends and we're going to have family members. We're going to have people we enjoy hanging out with. And, 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 and we may have some things in common, but you can't have this kind of biblical fellowship with people that are spiritually heading in a completely opposite direction. That's why the Bible even talks about, hey, don't get unequally yoked with somebody who is not a believer because you're heading in opposite directions spiritually. So like John, we need to proclaim what we know about Christ with those around us. You want to have better fellowship with this person that you, you, you're, is your friend or is your family member that you enjoy being around? You want to have the richest fellowship possible? Man, you bring them into fellowship with us. You bring them into fellowship with, with, with us, with the church, with God. In fact, in verse 4, he says, we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So our joy may be complete. I believe what he's saying here is that, that yes, there is joy. There's absolutely joy in having a relationship with God. Absolutely, there is joy in having a, a relationship with God. But there's even more joy when you have fellowship with other believers and God. That's the way he designed it. I think there's even more joy. You have a relationship with God, but then you have your relationship with God and other people who have a relationship with God. God wants us to have both vertical and horizontal relationships and fellowship. And as, and as we're going to see as, this, as we progress through this letter, you, I don't believe you can fully enjoy God unless you're enjoying fellowship with other believers. Not the way he intended it to be. After all, what are we going to be doing for eternity in heaven? If you envision it to just be you and God only up there, guess what? You're in for a surprise because we're all going to be there too. And we're going to be fellowshipping together and we're going to be worshiping God together and it's going to be phenomenal. But that's the way God intended it to be. And this is supposed to be just our, our warm-up game for that, where we're fellowshipping together like that. That's what we're going to be doing in heaven, fellowshipping with God and fellowshipping with one another. That's the life that God desires for us, and that's what he wants to offer us right now. But here's the thing. If we want to experience complete joy, he's talking about make our joy complete. If you want to experience complete joy, then I think that here's what I think. I think we need to have fellowship with God, absolutely. 
And if you're not a believer yet, you need to begin right there. I need, to, I, need to have, I need to be able to have fellowship with God. That only happens when you put your faith in Jesus. You begin to have fellowship with God. There is so much joy that's going to come into your life. We need to have joy. We have joy when we have fellowship with God. And we will have, we will have joy when we have fellowship with other believers. So it's going to even get better when you, when you experience fellowship with God and fellowship with other believers. But I think there's even one more aspect to it. I think we also, our joy is complete when we're bringing other people into fellowship with us, to fellowship with God. I think that's what he says. He says, look, I'm writing this to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, and then our joy is going to be complete. I'm writing this because I want, we want you to be in fellowship with us as we're fellowshipping with God because that's going to make our fellowship complete. Joy is complete when we're experiencing, I think, all of those things. Because think about it. Those people that you love, your, your, your friends, your, your family members, maybe it's your husband or wife, whoever it might be, Think of how much joy there would be when they come into fellowship with us as we fellowship with God. Any of you who have ever had the opportunity of leading someone to Jesus, you know, you know how awesome that is. You know how much joy that brings to your life. Amen? Oh man, it's the best. It is the best. And all of this is possible because of Jesus, the word of life, the word of life. So here's what I want us to walk away with today. Here's our takeaway. Here's our application. Get out your sermon notes if you're like, hey, I didn't really want to write anything down before this. Um, you know, you just figured you could memorize it all or you didn't want to even pay attention. Here's what you want you to pay attention to. Pull out your sermon notes page. You'll see three blank lines at the bottom. Here's what I'd like to encourage you to do. You don't have sermon notes page, you can just write it anywhere. I'd like each of us to, to write a list of three people. Three people that we care about that are in our lives that don't yet know Jesus. That aren't fellowshipping with us yet as, as the church. That aren't in relationship with God and therefore not in relationship, fellowship with us as believers. And you're going to begin to pray for those three people. Because you love them so much, you care about them, you want them to be in fellowship with us. You want them to, to, to know that when they die, they're going to go to heaven with us. And I want you to begin to pray for them and pray for opportunities to share with them. And you're going, well, I can't really share with people. I don't know enough about the Bible. Let me just give you two really simple things. First of all, you begin praying. You just begin to pray. You, you begin to pray for them. You begin to pray for yourself. And, and then you just do, do one or both of these two things. Number one, you just share your story. What has God done in your life? What difference has Jesus made in your life? And guess what? People can't argue with that. They can't refute it. You just share with them what God's done in your life. What difference has he made in your life? And, and here's the other thing you can do. You can just invite them to, to come to church on Sunday. We're going to be we're gonna be going through 1 John. And oh man, there's so many opportunities in here where, where they're going to hear the truth about Jesus. And we're hoping that the light's going to turn on. And they're going to come to know what's true about Jesus. And they're going to come to know how much God loves them. And the light's going to turn on for them. And it's going to make all the difference in their life. And guess what? It's going to make your joy complete. What do you say? Can we do it? Can we? Okay. I said, uh, we'll see. You didn't sound that convincing. A couple of you did. <laughs> A couple of you sounded ready. But uh, let's just begin to pray for those people. And let's begin to just uh, look for opportunities. Pray for ourselves for courage and for boldness and for wisdom. Let's pray for that right now. Join with me as we pray. Father God, we just, we thank you. We praise you. Um, 
that you sent your son, Jesus, the word of life, to come and to live among us. You put some flesh on, became a person just like us so that we could experience you like never before. But also, God, so Jesus could live a life a perfect life so he could die on that cross and make a way for us to be in relationship with you. We thank you. We praise you for that. We thank you that because of what Jesus did, we not only get to have a personal relationship with you right now, but we can know when we put our faith in him that we're going to go to heaven and we're going to spend eternity with you in heaven. I praise you and thank you for that. It's such a great thing to know and to be sure of. And Lord, every person here can be sure of that also. Every person here can walk out those doors today knowing that they're going to go to heaven when they die, when their life here on earth is done. Lord, I just pray right now that you begin to stir in the hearts of those people that are here today that don't yet know that. They don't have that assurance. They're not quite sure what will happen to them. They're not even quite sure what to believe about you. I pray, God, right now, you just begin to move in their hearts. Help them to, to just know how much you love them. To know that Jesus died on the cross for them. And know that you've got a great plan for their life, not only here, but forever. And if you're here today, and that's you, you came here today a little unsure, and you'd like to know, or maybe you just want to find out more, if you, if you need to, to explore a relationship with Jesus for the very first time, with our eyes closed, our heads bowed, just, just raise your hand. Who is that today? Who needs to do that? Anyone? Just raise your hand in response to God. Someone need to do that this morning? And we want so bad for you to know Jesus. We want so badly for you to, to understand how much he loves you. Father God, we just thank you that you love each person in this room. You know each of us, not only by name, but you know us better than we know ourselves. God, we just pray. I pray for, for those here today who are holding back, those here today who to this point have never said yes to you. And I pray today, God, would be the day where they say, you know what, I need Jesus in my life. can experience a relationship with you like never before. Lord, we pray for the names of the people that are written down. You know each of those people so very well. God, you know each of their needs. You know where each of them are at in life. Lord, you died on that cross for each of those people. And God, we want so badly for them to know you. So God, we pray that you'd just be working on them. God, we pray that you'd bring people into their lives. We pray for the people here, God, that wrote down their names. Give them courage. Give them boldness. Give them wisdom. Give them opportunity to share their story, to invite them to come and see. Lord, we'd like to see each and every name written down come to know you. We lift each of them up to you. In the powerful name of Jesus. It's in his name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen.